Uh, well, good morning. We are going to look at the New Jerusalem once again. This is part four of a four-part series. Uh, I know that uh, several of you ha have unanswered questions, and I hope to add to that list with today's presentation. Um, I want to tell you that uh, today I had difficulty getting to the facility. Um, our normal route uh, to FBC where we meet on Sunday mornings. Uh, there's construction uh, on, on a major road that we typically use. And then this weekend, the second route that we typically used is shut down. I, I, I don't know for how long, but I know that it started today. And so I went to Route 3 and was going down the road, and wouldn't you know it, uh, the, the way I was going to go was blocked off with barricades for a bike race, of all things. And so I went to Route 4 and made it successfully here. And, and so it, it, just, it just made me thankful that there are so many ways to get to where we meet. Uh, because I think it's important that we do come and that we do... Uh, fellowship together, and that we do learn about what God's Word has to teach us. Okay, the New Jerusalem, part four. And as I've done every week, I'm going to start with this passage in Hebrews 11, because it goes back to Abraham. Abraham was looking for the New Jerusalem. Abraham was looking for the city which has foundations whose architect and builder is God. He sojourned in a land that would ultimately be his by heritage, but he looked forward to the day, he looked forward to a future day when, when he would dwell in the city which has foundations and gates, by the way, whose architect and builder is God. So let's talk about why Jerusalem, and let's look at uh, at least a few Old Testament passages that, that talk about why God has chosen Jerusalem. Second Chronicles 6.6, 6, this is in the context of, uh, in the days of Solomon, and this is uh, you know, Solomon re relating uh, what God has declared. And, and God says, but I have chosen Jerusalem that my name might be there. And I have chosen David to be over my people, Israel. In Psalm 132, verses 13 to 14, For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for His habitation. His habitation. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. Zechariah chapter 2, verses 10 to 13. And I will share with you before I read this paragraph that this is, this is in the context, I believe, of, of the day of the Lord. Verse 13, I believe, is a day of the Lord passage. And I... I think I can make a compelling case for that. We don't have time to do that this morning, but um, you know, if you're interested in that, uh, shoot me an email or uh, give me a phone call, and uh, let's talk. Zechariah 2, 10 to 13, Sing for joy and be glad, O daughter of Zion, for behold, I am coming, and I will dwell in your midst, declares the Lord. Many nations will join themselves to the Lord in that day and will become my people. Then I will dwell in your midst, and you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. The Lord will possess Judah as his portion in the Holy Land, and will again choose Jerusalem. Isn't that interesting? Judah is going to be his portion. He's from the tribe of Judah. And he will again choose Jerusalem. Be silent, all flesh, before the Lord, for He is aroused from His holy habitation. And I believe that this is a reference to uh, Revelation 
um, where there was silence in heaven for a half an hour when the day of the Lord actually commences, uh, according to uh, the description uh, given to us by the Apostle John. But Judah will be inhabited forever, Joel 3.20, and Jerusalem for all generations. There's, there's going to be a permanence from the perspective of eternity with regard to the new Jerusalem and its location in the land of Israel. Jeremiah chapter 30 um, the second half of verse 17 and verse 18, because they have called you an outcast, saying, it is Zion, no one cares for her. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will restore the fortunes of the tent of, tents of Jacob and have compassion on his dwelling places, and the city will be rebuilt on its ruin, and the palace will stand on its rightful place. Uh, now it's interesting, the, the Hebrew word, that's translated ruin uh, in the New American Standard. It's the Hebrew word tell. Does anybody know what a tell is? From a, yeah, (laughs) yeah. Not not from a a, a poker perspective, but from an archeological perspective. A tell is a mound. Typically, a tell refers to a city that has been rebuilt perhaps multiple times over the centuries, and each time it was destroyed, they would take you know, part of what was left over in the rubble to rebuild on the existing foundation. And so it, over time, the, the mound or the hill would get higher and higher and higher. Um, and there's you know, multiple examples of that uh, over in the land of Israel as uh, Pastor Steve uh, or I or anybody who's been over there uh, uh, can attest. The city will be rebuilt on its tell. And it will actually sit where Jerusalem stands today. But it will cover a lot more area. It will be, um, I mean, it it will be massive in terms of its size. Behold, days are coming, Jeremiah 31 tells us, declares the Lord, when the city will be rebuilt for the Lord from the tower of Ananel to the corner gate. The measuring line will go out farther straight ahead to the hill Garab, then it will turn uh, to Goa. And, And these, you know, these passages that I'm reading to you, They've, they've not yet been fulfilled, and in particular, the next one, uh, in Zechariah chapter 14, which tells us that the land will be changed into a plain. Right now, Jerusalem sits in the mountains of Israel, ancient Judea and Samaria, the mountains of Israel. And the mountains of Israel are going to be changed into a plain, those, those great um, topographical uh, changes that, that we've alluded to in, um, in, in, in past considerations of the New Jerusalem. All the land will be changed into a plain from Geba to Rimmon south of Jerusalem. I mean, that's, a, that's like, I believe, over 40 miles you know, on the diagonal. Um, it, it, it's a lengthy, it's going to be a lengthy plain. But it's going it, to... It's going to be absolutely necessary for the New Jerusalem to be able to fit on present-day Israel. God is going to prepare the land for His city. But Jerusalem will rise and remain on its site from Benjamin's gate as far as the place of the first gate to the corner gate and from the tower of Ananel to the king's wine presses. People will live in it. There will no longer be a curse for Jerusalem will dwell in security. So, that is why God chooses Jerusalem. Now what I'd like to do, um, I'd I'd actually like to let you know about a book 
uh, in the parentheses down at the bottom of the slide, uh, uh, you know, I've told you that I've adapted this particular slide from a, from a chart that's contained in this book. Um, this book was written by Janet Willis. Uh, she's a pastor's wife, strong believer in Jesus Christ. And she has written a book entitled, What on Earth is Heaven Like? A Look at God's City, New Jerusalem. And I will tell you that uh, part of what I've presented uh, in, in this series has, has come as a result of reading this book. I found it to be very helpful. Now, as always, when recommending a book, I'm not saying it's inerrant. I'm not saying it's infallible. There may be some things in here I disagree with, but it is definitely worth the read especially if you're interested in the subject and the topic of the New Jerusalem, because the Bible has a lot to say both in the Old Testament and the New Testament uh, about this reality. I thought it might be helpful to read a short portion from the introduction to give you a sense of why she wrote the book. I found it absolutely captivating. I went online and, and read a little bit about her testimony and immediately I ordered the book because of, of what had transpired in her life. This is from the introduction. This book was born out of adversity. Allow me to briefly share. In 1994, over 20 years ago, my oldest three children were married but my life was full. I had the joy and privilege of homeschooling our youngest six. So that tells you that she and her husband at that point had six children, or nine children. Three married, and six were living at home. In November of that year, 1994, my husband and I were in an accident that took the lives of those six ages 13 down to six weeks old. The gas tank ruptured and exploded into our van. In the midst of shock and trauma, God kept me sane. At the accident scene, my husband helped me focus on what was true. God has prepared us for this, Scott called out to me. And as strange as it may sound, I knew he was right. For 20 years prior to that day, I had the privilege to learn many truths from the Bible. I knew God was all-powerful. For those who love Him, there is no such thing as an accident. I also knew that God was good. He loved me and He loved my children, yes, even that very day. I understood that when they went to heaven, they were going to enjoy everything I could ever want for them. They were going to be happy, they were going to be safe, and they were going to be good forever. In the aftermath, as the quiet days, weeks, and years wore on, I had all kinds of time to read and study my Bible like never before. Prior to our accident, I already had a long view of life, but now things about heaven jumped off the page. I discovered God had revealed so much more about heaven than I ever realized. I kept detailed notes of what I was learning, but new questions arose, particularly questions about the new Jerusalem. If believers who die go to Jerusalem above, where will they live when the Lord returns to this earth? Curiosity slowly gave way to a passion for truth. It was a treasure hunt. Eventually, the results of this quest were unexpected. And she goes on to talk about three assumptions she had made about the New Jerusalem, which she discovered in her studies, did not line up with what the Word of God teaches. High view of Scripture. She had a strong, abiding faith in Jesus Christ. And the Word of God, as she interacted with it, gave her fresh insight into where those six children were and what they were experiencing. 
I began this study with a focus on what my children might be experiencing. Adversity was the initial motivator, but gently and wisely, God changed my focus. As I learned more about what eternity is really going to be like, I gained a greater understanding of God's own goodness. And let me uh, read for you uh, what's written in a, in a memorial to the six. This is in memory of the B team, Ben, Joe, Sam, Hank, Elizabeth, and Pete. And then there's six silhouettes there holding hands. And then it says, the last got to be first. I love that. So, what on earth is heaven like? A look at God's city, New Jerusalem by Janet Willis. And here's some um, similarities. And, and, and we've, looked, we've looked at this information, most of it, uh, in, in one form or another, and I've just combined it all on one slide uh, just by way of review. From Ezekiel's point of view and John's point of view, the city has a square base on elevated land. It has 12 gates. There are three gates on each side and each gate is named for one of the 12 tribes of Israel. This city has no temple in it. We saw that from uh, the book of Ezekiel and also the book of Revelation. The land, what's uh, known as, um, as the allotment, the land on which the city rests and on which the temple outside the, the city is built, the land is um, referred to as uh, uh, Kodesh, Kodesh. It's referred to as Holy, Holy, <laughs> uh, which, is a, which is a Hebrew uh, idiom. You know, when you repeat Hebrew words, uh, it's for emphasis. And most often that would be uh, translated, that land is most holy. John describes the New Jerusalem as being holy. It will be the capital of the world and the Lord will be there forever and ever. When this kingdom is established, Daniel tells us in Daniel chapter 7 that it is a kingdom that will have no end. It will be an ever lasting kingdom. And I know we sometimes speak about the millennial kingdom uh, as though it has a specific beginning and a specific end. And we, we need to be careful with our terminology. When Jesus, is, when Jesus establishes His kingdom, that kingdom will have no end. Now, there are certain things that will happen during the thousand years that are described in the Old Testament. There are, there are certain uh, things that will happen to, to Satan during that thousand years. Satan will be released at the end of the thousand years and will lead a rebellion. And that rebellion will be summarily uh, snuffed out by fire from heaven as they they go to the broad plain. This is really interesting. I, you, know, I, you know how you read passages and sometimes things click for the very first time? I'm, I'm reading Revelation 21 this morning. It's early. It's like, I don't know, 5.30, quarter six. I'm reading Revelation 21 and I read the passage where you know, Satan you know, brings um, you know, the forces that he has marshaled, uh, including Gog and Magog, and, and they surround, they, they come to the broad plain, speaks of the broad plain, right? The broad plain's already in existence, and, and they uh, surround the camp and the beloved city. And so that language, I mean, it just, it, it, it just reminded me uh, uh, of this you know, transition uh, that 
that I have personally made about the timing of when the New Jerusalem uh, comes down. Okay, let's move on ahead. We've actually got uh, two slides today that are going to take up a majority of the time. Um, I'm now through my introduction. And, and so uh, what I want to do is I, I want to demonstrate how Isaiah chapter 54 uses remarkably similar, similar terminology to um, you know, Revelation 21 and 22. Uh, and in one case, uh, there's a connection made uh, between Isaiah 54 and Revelation 16. All of that to say, uh, what is being described in Isaiah 54 has to do with the New Jerusalem, even though the New Jerusalem uh, is not identified by name. That is what I am uh, suggesting to you. So if you have your Bibles, let's turn back and forth from uh, Isaiah 54 and then the appropriate passage in uh, Revelation. Isaiah 54, uh, the first line of verse 3. And that, uh, and by the way, Isaiah 54 is all about the Messiah's uh, promise of Israel's restoration. Uh, that's what this chapter uh, deals with. For you will spread abroad to the right and to the left. So, Suggesting, um, suggesting significant size there. Uh, chapter 21 and verse 16 reads as following. The city is laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its width. And he measured the city with a rod, 1,500 miles. Its length and width and height are equal. And... Uh, if we if we have time today, um, uh, I I, I want to unpack Revelation twenty one sixteen and give uh, for you a possible uh, interpretation of of that verse. Okay, back to chapter fifty four. Let's look at the second and third lines of verse three. Your descendants will possess nations, and they will resettle the desolate cities. Your descendants will possess nations. Look at chapter 22, the last line of verse 3 and the last line of verse 5. His bondservants shall serve him, and they shall reign forever and ever. Okay, back to chapter 54. Look at the first two lines of verse 10. For the mountains may be removed and the hills may shake, but my loving kindness will not be removed from you. And then looking at chapter 16, which describes this great earthquake at the very end uh, of the day of the Lord. It's an earthquake that has never been experienced in the history uh, of mankind um, up to that point. Revelation 16, uh, verses 17 and, and 18. And the seventh angel poured out his bowl upon the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were flashes of lightning, and sounds and peals of thunder, and there was a great earthquake, such as there had not been since man came to be upon the earth, so great an earthquake was it, and so mighty. So this is even greater than the other earthquakes that are described in the book of Revelation. I mean, this one, this one apparently is the one that causes all of those topographical uh, changes that we read about uh, in, in both the Old and New Testaments. Okay, verses 11 and 12 of chapter 54 of Isaiah. O afflicted one, storm-tossed and not comforted, behold, I will set your stones in antimony and your foundations I will lay in sapphires. 
Moreover, I will make your battlements of rubies and your gates of crystals, of crystal, and your entire wall of precious stones. That sound familiar? Sounds to me like Revelation uh, 21 and uh, verses. Um, Revelation 21, verses 18 to 21. Had the wrong chapter there, excuse me. And the material of the wall was jasper, and the city was pure gold like clear glass. The foundation stones of the city wall were adorned with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation stone was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth praise, the, the eleventh Jason and the twelfth Amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each one of the gates was a single pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. Okay, back to Isaiah 54. Look, look at the first phrase of verse 14. In righteousness you will be established. Let's consider verses 10 and 17 of chapter 21. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. And he, and he measured its wall 72 yards according to human measurements, which are also angelic measurements. Okay, let's look at uh, chapter 54 and the last two phrases of verse 14. You will be far from oppression, for you will not fear, and from terror, for it will not come near you. So in other words, it will be a place of protection. It will be a place of safety. And we've already considered uh, these words from verse 12 of Revelation 21. The new Jerusalem has a great and high wall with 12 gates, and at the gates, 12 angels. And what does it tell us about entrance into the city? It's only accessible by those whose names have been, been written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Only believers may enter the New Jerusalem. It is restricted access. Unbelievers, liars, murderers, idolaters, adulterers, they may not enter according to the testimony of both Revelation chapter 21 as well as chapter 22. Okay, look at the third line of verse 17 in Isaiah 54. This is the heritage of the servants of of the Lord. And compare with that verse 7 of chapter 21 of Revelation. He who overcomes shall inherit these things and I will be his God and he will be my son. The new Jerusalem is an inheritance that we receive from God. And it is called God's holy city. All right. Let's look at Revelation 16, verses 17 to 18. Again, this is the um, uh, passage which um, I believe and understand that great uh, topographical changes uh, will take place as a result. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl upon the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne saying, it is done. There were flashes of lightning, sounds and peals of thunder. There was a great earthquake, such as there had not been since man came to be upon the earth. So great an earthquake was it, and so mighty. So let's turn to uh, these three Old Testament references first. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 4. And I'll be reading uh, verses... 24 through 26. I looked on the mountains, and behold, they were quaking, and all the hills moved to and fro. And I looked, and behold, there was no man, and all the birds of the heaven 
heavens had fled. And I looked, and behold, the fruitful land was a wilderness. All its cities were pulled down before the Lord, before His fierce anger. Now, what does that line, last line suggest to you in terms of its language? What period of time are we talking about? The day of the Lord. The day of His wrath. The day of His fierce anger. And that's, you know, that's the, the setting, that's the time frame of Revelation 16, verses 17 and 18. Uh, flip over to uh, Nahum. Book of Nahum. Nahum chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. Mountains quake because of him, and the hills dissolve. Indeed, the earth is upheaved by his presence, the world and all the inhabitants in it. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the burning of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire, and the rocks are broken up by him. Again, day of the Lord language. Who can stand before his indignation? That's a word that's commonly used in Old Testament passages when speaking about this coming day of the Lord. The burning of his anger, his wrath poured out like fire. Again, very descriptive of what we uh, refer to as the day of the Lord. And then Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. And I'll be reading verses 4, 5, and 9. 4, 5, and 9. Let every valley be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. This is in the context, this is talking about uh, the comfort that comes from the uh, future deliverance of Israel and the and the, the deliverance of God's people and let the rough ground become a plain and the rugged terrain a broad valley then the glory of the Lord will be revealed all flesh will see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken and then verse 9 get yourself up on a high mountain O Zion, bearer of good news, lift up your voice mightily, O Jerusalem, bearer of good news. Lift it up, do not fear, say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. Jesus Christ will be residing in the new Jerusalem. Okay, time to make an executive decision here. All right, let's turn to 2 Peter chapter 3. I, I, will not, I will not unpack the entire chapter, but I do want to point out a couple of highlights. And I think it's helpful to read the entire chapter in one sitting. It has to do with the last days. It has to do with certain things that are true in our day today. And there is um, much information in this chapter regarding the day of the Lord. This is now, beloved, the second letter I am writing to you in which I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandments of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. Know this, first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come. The Bible predicts that as we get closer to the return of Jesus Christ, more and more people will deny the reality that Jesus is coming. Now, the sad reality is some of those marker, some of those mockers 
are within the professing church. And we'll leave it to God to determine what their relationship to Him is. Know this first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of His coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. Now, does the Bible tell us that everything has been the same since creation? No. There was this little event known as the global flood, which totally changed our atmosphere, totally changed the surface of the earth, and allowed the radioactive rays of the sun to penetrate the atmosphere, thereby severely shortening the lifespan of human beings on planet Earth. Before the flood and after the flood. It's because of the changes on planet Earth. God destroyed the the world with water. Now, the world remained. It wasn't obliterated. It didn't go out of existence, but it was destroyed. I believe that the earth and the heavens or the atmosphere will be destroyed by fire during the day of the Lord, and then there will be a new heaven and a new earth. This false belief, this false teaching is actually on the level of a religion because this is one of the main tenets of the religion of evolution. Sometimes referred to, I believe, as uniformitarianism. And if I got that word wrong, check, check with Pastor Steve and he, he might be able to, to give you... Um, some more clarity with regard to that. But, but e- evolution is based upon the premise that everything that we now see is the way everything has been. And the Bible declares otherwise. Now, look at what God says about people in the last days who hold that position. Look at what it says. For when they maintain this, that everything has been the same, since the beginning of creation. When they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and by water through which the world at that time was destroyed being flooded by water. They deny the flood because they deny the Bible because they deny the the validity of God's word. And In a sense, they deny the trustworthiness of God Himself when they deny His Word. But the present heavens and earth by His Word are being reserved for fire kept for the day of judgment and the destruction of godly men. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow about His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Now, Pastor Steve and his message today, what a strong presentation of the Gospel and the truth of the Gospel. It's all about the Gospel. And even in this passage regarding the day of the Lord, Peter lays out the Gospel. God wants people to be saved. He has made provision through His Son, Jesus Christ, who is God in human flesh. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. It's during the day of the Lord that the earth will be destroyed by fire. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? In light of the coming day of the Lord, how should we live? 
looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God on account of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. Now look at the next phrase. But according to His promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. And the new heaven and the new earth will be when the new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven. The city of God. The holy mountain of God. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by Him in peace, spotless and blameless, and regard the patience of our Lord to be salvation. Now, we're going back, I don't know how long, has it been a couple of years that we've had power to stand? Just about, just about two years? And the reason, the reason that we started this class in the very beginning was to teach people who come to FBC how to live for Christ until Christ comes. And that's what this passage is about. It's a prophetic passage. And what's the emphasis as far as Christians is concerned? To live for Jesus Christ until He comes. What's the emphasis for unbelievers? Get right with God, repent of your sins, believe in the Gospel. We see that in example after example after example in New Testament prophetic passages. The purpose of prophecy is is that it, it is designed to teach us how to live today in light of what God declares will happen tomorrow or in the future. Teach us how to live today in light of what God declares will take place in the future. All right. That didn't take nearly as long as I thought it would. Okay, and I, I have time. That's good. All right, let's turn to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. All right, this reads, He carried me away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. So this is, this is the city that God has built. I believe this is the city that Jesus alluded to in John chapter 14. You remember that passage? This is the night before Jesus Christ was crucified. And He gave an incredible amount of teaching as recorded by the Gospel of John to His disciples on that night. Listen to how chapter 14 of John's Gospel begins. Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in Me. That's a claim to deity. Jesus is declaring Himself to be God. You believe in God, you believe also in Me. In My Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. The promise of the second coming is based upon the fact that He's working on the new Jerusalem right now. and receive you to Myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Again, this is yet another reason why I believe the Scriptures teach that the New Jerusalem comes down at the beginning of the thousand years rather than at the end. I know there are people that disagree with that, and that's okay. It's not a, you know, it's not a matter of, of, of faith in the sense of orthodoxy and the gospel. Believers disagree on the timing of these things. But it does make sense if you understand it at the beginning when you consider 
this description by Jesus Christ that where we will be dwelling forever, it's being it, it, it's going to be be prepared by the Father and the Son until Jesus returns, right? That we may be with Him forever. I mean, it's it's pretty straightforward. You know, when, when you begin to link all these things together, um, I, I, I think a credible case can be made. Okay, so, um, that where I am, there you may be also, and you know the way where I am going. All right, so let's go back to Revelation uh, 21. And, you know, this is, um, if you get this book and if you read it, um, Janet's insight into verse 16, um, it, it, it's difficult to wrap the mind around it, and, and I, you know, I, I'm probably not sufficient uh, to present it to you today, but you know, I, I think it's a, uh, it, an, an unusual perspective, and it, it helps to solve uh, the dilemma of the um, of the sizes described, you know the massive sizes described in uh, in the book of Revelation. The city is laid out as a square, just as Ezekiel tells us. John tells us that, and its length is as great as its width. And he measured the city with a rod. So in other words, the city at the bottom is square. That's what he's saying. At its base. Now, notice what John records when the city is measured. 1,500 miles. Uh, I, I think some of your translations, uh, it might say stadia. Does it mention stadia? I don't know. Um, there's, you know, there's uh, there's different different opinions as to what that that you know measurement actually you know represents. It it might be closer to 1,300 miles and change um, from the calculation that have been made by some. But whatever the case, look at the last phrase: its length and width and height. Are equal. Now we're not talking about the base, right? Now we're talking about the entire structure. Its length, its width, and its height are equal. And and if it's if it's actually describing, you know, this fifteen hundred miles if it's describing those three measurements rather than the two measurements, you understand? Then we're dealing with cube roots rather than 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles. I mean, have, you ever, have you ever seen depictions of, of a structure of the New Jerusalem on planet Earth, how big it is if it's going to be 1,500 miles? And... Yeah, I mean, it just, it's hard for us to grasp and understand. Now, it is possible that God could suspend the laws of physics and that, that he could work and demonstrate his power in such a way as to allow f- for those things to transpire and take place. But if this is um, describing either a cube or, or perhaps a, a, a pyramid-like shape, and it's looking at the total measurement as a cube root, then you're looking at somewhere, somewhat, uh, something closer to 11 miles by 11 miles by 11 miles. Now, again, it's an observation. And... It's not a black and white. 
and I'm not, um, I'm not pointing to this as, as the most significant uh, thing about this book that I'm recommending to you. But uh, I just share that with you uh, to, to at least consider. Um, because, again, there's three measurements that are said to be equal here in relation to the 1,500 miles. All right. Mount Sinai versus the New Jerusalem. Who doesn't like free? So, is somebody trying to Skype this? Hello, Skype. Uh, I have no idea how to get rid of that. Um, but let's talk about Mount Sinai in the New Jerusalem in the time that, that we have left. Pastor Steve, um, when he was preaching through the book of Hebrews, he did this, he did this, great, um, he did this great sermon on the two mountains. Um, does anybody remember that? I, re I remember that sermon, brother. I remember it. I remember it. I mean, you laid it out. And you made, you made a distinction between Mount Sinai, remember, and Mount Zion. Okay? And in the context, in the passage, when you read it, if Mount Zion is the New Jerusalem, then that would line up extremely well with Paul's terminology at the end of um, at the end of Galatians chapter four, turn if you would to Galatians chapter four. Now. We know that there are some people who approach the Bible who want to make the Bible totally allegorical. And, and, and we know the problems associated with that. Having made that observation, there is allegory in the Bible. But we need to be careful and cautious and allow the Bible to indicate when it's speaking in allegorical terms. Otherwise, we should interpret in a normal, common sense interpretation. Some people like to use the word literal, um, and 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 we, we, you know whatever terminology you use there, in it, in its a normal sense, should be the way uh, that it's that it's interpreted and. We shouldn't deviate from that unless there's something in the context that specifically instructs us to do so. Look at the uh, last couple of paragraphs of Galatians 4, verses 21 to 31. Tell me, you who want to be under law, do, not listen, do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the bondwoman and one by the free woman. But the son by the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and the son by the free woman through the promise. This is allegorically speaking. For these women are two covenants, one proceeding from Mount Sinai, bearing children who are to be slaves. She is Hagar. Now this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem. For she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, barren woman who does not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For more are the children of the desolate than, the one, than, than of the one who has a husband. And you, brethren, like Isaac, are children of promise. But as at that time, he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, so it is now also. But what does the Scripture say? 
Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be an heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of a bondwoman, but of a free woman. A distinction made between Mount Sinai and Jerusalem, or Mount Zion. And, and it's, it's, it's Mount Zion which is above. It's Jerusalem which is in heaven, which will descend from heaven to the earth after the return of Jesus Christ. Okay, flip over now to Hebrews chapter 12. And uh, let's look at the last two paragraphs of that chapter, including the fifth and final warning passage in the book of Hebrews. So it's going to talk about the new Jerusalem, and then it's going to talk about the fifth warning passage. I, I, I find that fascinating. Verse 18, For you have not come to a mountain that may be touched into a blazing fire and to darkness and gloom and whirlwind. Remember Mount Sinai when God gave the law? You know, they couldn't go on the mountain. They couldn't touch the mountain. Remember that? It was restrictive. Well, what does it say about the New Jerusalem? Only believers may enter. Unbelievers can't go there. Right? There was, there was smoke, there was fire, there was a whirlwind, right? Well, the glory of the Lord is going to be at the top of the New Jerusalem. I mean, there's, there's going to be an encampment around the city. There's going to be a temple outside the city. And there's going to be an encampment by tribes just to, just as there was an encampment at Mount Sinai, there will be an arrangement of tribes around the New Jerusalem. You know, with those, you know, with those Jews who, who enter, who, who enter the Messianic kingdom in, in order to help repopulate it, along with Gentiles who, who enter with the capacity to, uh, to procreate. All right. Verse 19. And to the blast of a trumpet and sound of words which sound was such that those who heard begged that no further words should be spoken to them, for they could not bear the command. If even a beast touches the mountain, it will be stoned. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I am full of fear and trembling. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, and to Jesus, a mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of, uh, of Abel. We're related to God through faith in Jesus Christ. We are participants in the new covenant. And, and our Jerusalem is the heavenly Jerusalem. Not the earthly one. It's the heavenly one. I mean, it, as fascinating as present day Jerusalem is, that's not our home. It will be the location of our home someday. But that Jerusalem is not our home. It's the Jerusalem that's in heaven. See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking, for if those did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less shall we escape who turn away from him who warns from heaven. His voice shook the earth then, but now he is promised, saying, Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. Interesting that he shares that passage in relation to the heavenly Jerusalem. I mean, this is day of the Lord terminology. And this expression yet once more denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken as of created things in order that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Let's look forward to the new Jerusalem, to the, the city whose builder and architect is God, who has foundation and gates. 
comprised of precious, precious gems and gold. It has the tree of life. <laughs> it's where, where Jesus Christ will dwell forever. It's where he will rule and reign over his kingdom for all eternity. And let's be reminded once again that until he comes, we should be sharing this truth with those who do not yet believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay, let's pray, and then I will collapse. Thank you. Father, uh, we want to thank you for this time that we've had in your word. And we ask, Father, that you will help us to continue our study and consideration of the new Jerusalem, of our future home. Father, we've just barely scratched the surface. And I personally look forward in this coming year to study in more depth those passages in the Old and New Testaments which speak of our future home. Father, we once again want to thank you and praise you that heaven is our home because of your Son, Jesus Christ, and the price that he paid on our behalf, taking upon himself the sins of the world that they might be be judged on the cross and that we might be forgiven. Father, we say thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.